So welcome to the RPG Academy YouTube page. I am Michael and we are going to do another Synergy session today. If you're not familiar with the Synergy session, that is where we will open a pack of Magic the Gathering cards, use those cards to inspire the outlining of the creation of an encounter, an adventure, potentially an entire campaign. Uh, with me today is my guest from the Rollist podcast, Calum. Calum, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. Bonjour. Bonjour. So you are in London, correct? Yes, I am in uh, London, in South Bermondsey, to be precise. Awesome. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with your podcast, uh, give us the quick elevator pitch for what your show does. Well, I would say why many podcasts are about uh, role-playing games, uh, the system, the games themselves, sometimes actual play. Mine is slightly more about uh, the role players themselves, uh, how different their uh, walk of life can be. And even when meeting game designers, sometimes famous like uh, Monty Cook, we will get an interest more about uh, how they started role-playing games, uh, etc. All right, fantastic. And for anyone that doesn't know, your podcast is the newest network member of the RBG Academy Network. So welcome to the yeah. team. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Awesome. So with, oh, go ahead. No, no. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, that's great. It's, uh, it's awesome. I, I love being part of a group. And uh, as I already said on Twitter, it's really nice to, to have uh, some uh, funny exchanges in the background uh, <laughs> on Slack every day. Yeah. Um, it, it can get interesting, but uh, we are very excited to have you. We love your show. We love what you're bringing to the quote unquote table with your show. But let's get into the synergy session today. Um, so you are my guest. I have three packs of cards. You can choose which one we use. I have a Aether or Ether Revolt, a Shadows over Innistrad, and a Kaladesh. Do any of those three strike your fancy? The thing is, I have absolutely zero knowledge of of uh, Magic the Gathering, but in the honor of a very friendly uh, tabletop role-playing game called Shadows of Esran, I will go to with the Shadows of... What is it? Yes. What is it Shadows say? over Innistrad. Innistrad. Let's go. Okay. Okay, so again, if you're not familiar with the Synergy session, we're going to open the pack. We're going to look at them probably the same way you would look at them if you cracked a pack in your, fav your favorite game store, sort of backside to front. We're going to use the cards to inspire an idea for probably what will be an adventure. Uh, we can use any part of the card we want, so the title of the card, the art of the card, the mechanics that it has, any flavor text, whatever the case may be, whatever sticks out to us and inspires us is what we will use. We're also under no obligation to use a card. So if three or four cards in, we have one that just does not make sense for the story that we're building, we can just toss it out or maybe set it aside and we may come back around to it later because something else might come up that will make that card make a little bit more sense. All right, so our first card is Pieces of the Puzzle. Yes, is there anything about this that just stricks out to you right away on, on what this could be for an adventure? I quite like the. Uh, I'm going away a bit from the, the 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 text of the card, but I really like the the setting of it. This uh, wide cliffs, which seems very sharp, so it could be nice uh, as a starting point to, to have the idea that we start in a place where we've got these very uh, scenic cliffs, scenic cliffs with uh, with uh, caves, uh, etc. And and this guy looks like he found something uh, of. Uh, of great power so maybe it's it, it looks a bit like jamie lannister in game of thrones so maybe <laughs> he's not a, ma a magician per se but he found something very powerful in one of those caves and he, he's gonna use it to his advantage maybe yeah i um the first thing that came to my mind would be and this again it's very typical D D stuff is that an npc not necessarily one of the characters uh, started to uncover some mystery. I mean, almost you think of like a Call of Cthulhu sort of, uh, you know, an outer world threat, but you've stumbled upon it and you're starting to get these pieces of a, of a puzzle, to use the text, uh, that's like hinting at this larger conspiracy. And of course, that NPC will probably go missing and then the PCs might have to retrace their steps, uh, try to refine the things that they found and then take over that investigation. Uh, I agree with you. I think the, the, again, I love the art. It's one of the reasons why we've done these is the art is always very invocative. And I can definitely see a scene in the game, an encounter, a combat happening in this place with these very high rocky cliffs, jagged edges. You know, there's a chance someone could fall off. There could be caves that you dive in and out of that loop back around like a, like a mystery. 
but certainly I, I think it, we probably need to go with, maybe get a few more cards for context. But but my my inclination would be to use it as an NPC has found something and then the players stumble into it, or maybe the NPC is a uh, a confidant or a mentor and reaches out to the players like, hey, I found this thing and I need your help. Yeah, it looks nice. It doesn't look well. I I, I named Jimmy Lannister. I guess Jimmy Lannister looks nice, but it's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> but I, hope, I, I still think he'll be redeemed in the end. But but yeah, I agree that it actually does look a lot like Jimmy Lannister. All right, so let's move on to our next. Okay, so for me, this fits very well with what we were talking about before, where there's an official organization that might be also inspecting these clues. Uh, you know, almost like a Sherlock Holmes and then the Scotland Yard situation where maybe our PCs using unorth- unorthodox methods will be more successful. This could be an NPC that is helpful to the PCs or maybe even works against them, whether intentionally trying to sabotage or just by the letter of the law, they will not let the PCs uh, go where they need to go without conflict. Uh, what are you thinking? Yeah, I think we are on the same page. I, I think she looks very badass, but she doesn't look friendly at all. No. And she, her garb is really, uh, really official. She definitely represents an, an authority. So yeah, I really like the idea. You mentioned Scotland Yard, but maybe pushing it a bit further as something. I'd like maybe this to be almost the villain of the, the story. I like villains which are not just ill, uh, ill-intentioned, be a villain which got intentions which are good but which are just misplaced so i could re- definitely see this being an official authority which doesn't like things to get out of their control so they're gonna she's gonna be in the way of the the, the playing characters quite often she's gonna try to stop them even arrest them on some misunderstanding uh but in the end they, they both work towards stopping that that thing which is happening and that she she obviously um, it's her job to to stop this kind of stuff i like a little detail i don't know if i see it properly on my screen but it's almost like she's got a, a siege shell symbol on her on her belt uh so i think it it, it matched quite nice avec with uh, the uh or previous seaside pictures no yeah i actually i, I really enjoy that as well where the villain isn't somebody they can just kill. Because again, it's D&D. Drawing swords is almost always an option. And here you could have a, a, a main antagonist who's not evil. They're just misguided or they're just ignorant of the true danger. They think they're doing the right thing, but they're actually hampering the PC's uh, investigation. And I, I like that idea because even if the PCs do eventually just draw swords and kill them, that's interesting in that type of story. Um, I like the idea better. You know, if it was a movie, I'm sure at the end, this uh, inspector will realize what happened, have a chance to redeem themselves, maybe even sacrifice themselves in a way that will uh, a- a- help the PCs at a crucial moment. Since it's a game and not a, a, a movie, we can't script it that well. But I like the idea of that being a possibility that we're working toward. Yeah, that it feels like stuff are starting to get out of hand already in that region. We've got already creatures of Cthulhu, well, not Cthulhu, but of whatever uh, popping out uh, in the forest. So, is it? Is it? A, what do you think, Michael? Is it a bad creature, or is it kind of a Princess Mononoke type of scenario where this creature is, or Avatar: The Last Bender, why this creature might be scary, but actually is trying to to protect the forest, and you know, I, I'm kind of seeing almost like in the middle. Like, I don't think it's a bad creature. I don't think it's evil or malicious, but Maybe it's a symptom of the problem that it's it's been forced out of its home, or maybe it's being drawn towards something. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I like the idea that it's it's it is almost like a tarasque. The way that I would use a tarasque is that you're not going to kill it. It's too it's too powerful. So you need to try to keep it from destroying other things. Like maybe it's on a collision course with a small village or a shrine, so, something that you don't want to be destroyed. But it's mindlessly moving forward. None of your attacks are powerful enough to stop it because it's so tough. How do you keep it from being a, a natural disaster sort of situation is probably how I would use it. Now, again, being D&D, the players may find a way around that and, and they can kill it. But maybe that's a bad thing because, again, it, it could be a, an ally or it could be an advantage later on if it's still around. It might be interesting maybe something to... Uh, um, not force, but uh, as the start of the story to keep the players in a, in an area, it might be something which 
uh, temporarily prevent them because we've seen those seaside cliffs which are very sharp and you it's probably difficult to to get a proper boat to go somewhere meaningful from there on the side of the sea so maybe on the other side of the village you got this big forest and with this creature popping out temporarily people are sort of besieged in that cliffside little village so maybe they 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 stuck there uh, for for a moment maybe that's something we can play early in the story to so to get a bit deeper in what's going on in that village rather than right away leave uh, for for somewhere else there's a an old godzilla movie it's one of the like godzilla versus so and so versus so and so where there is it's like a giant lobster and this island has created this like it's like a juice of some sort it's like a liquid that 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 they can sedate it so they fly over and they drop all this like uh polyme- pomegranate juice whatever it makes the lobster happy so then they can go in and out of the of the 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 island and then of course in the movie they run out or something happens and it goes crazy so maybe it could be something similar to that where there's something that the the village either has or can create that will placate it and allow them to go buy it or to use it, but they're missing something. So again, that could be the the quest of the PCs is to go get a thing and get back before the turtle destroys the village. So they're not fighting it. They're fighting the clock. And if they're late, then the village will be destroyed by this creature. Yeah, you could even, if they've got this substance for a long time, and that's a tradition, maybe there's some kind of synergy between the village and the creature because... Maybe the villagers got this uh, substance which they use on the creature to pass through, but at the same time, the creatures act as some kind of protection against other creatures a bit further down the line, orcs or, or even just brigands. Uh, but this way, if the PC create the tu- uh, if the the PC kill the creature, that create that situation that now the village is exposed to bigger dangers uh, a bit further. Oh, not bigger dangers, but danger which would be a proper invasion or uh, attacks by by people who, who actually know what they want from from that village or maybe they want the people want that substance to to control these creatures for for ill intended uh, things i i also like the idea this this is kind of a jerk dm move so i'd be careful with using it but with the right party where the pcs aren't from this village so they're unaware of this symbiotic relationship they come across this creature they fight it. They maybe they don't kill it. Maybe they just wound it. Then they get to the village and they're all like, "Hey, we we kicked the crap out of this thing." And everyone in the village is like, "Oh no! If you've done that, then we're going to get attacked any moment by the blah 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 blah." Uh, so then they actually have to go back and like help the turtle and maybe heal it, uh, you know, uh, wean it back to health type of a thing. So you could have a very different type of encounter where they're actually then having to go back out to the creature and try to make it better and mend its its wounds before the really bad thing shows up that it was keeping away from the town. I, I love this uh, Star Trek devil in the dark uh, sort of vibe. <laughs> uh, also, maybe we can go back to uh, that sort of um, uh, authority figure earlier. Maybe there's kind of an empire and the village, it's been kind of secret, that thing, and maybe that figure also might not see it positively what's happening, this control over creatures, or the Empire, when finding out about this, might be interested to, to get that secret themselves to, to use those the, the creatures in their, in their armies. So they, they want to take the protector and turn it into a weapon, because that always works out well. <laughs> awesome. All right, our next card is Senseless Rage. So looking at the picture, it almost looks like a zombie. Mm-hmm. It's a very mm-hmm. long-haired... Uh, Looks uh, hard to tell if it's male or female, but it's got very long hair. It's punching a window, and there's blood on the window, and the glass is shattering. So it's sort of like like rage or like a zombie infection, where they're just mindless brutes that are attacking. Um, so that could be a symptom again of this of this puzzle that we're trying to put together. This this conspiracy, possibly interplanar conspiracy, where. Um, you could have an entire village that slowly gets infected. So it's almost like a zombie outbreak, but it's not exactly zombieism. So the mm-hmm. PCs can show up. They're at the tavern. They're having drinks. They're trying to figure out who's involved in this conspiracy. And then one person in the town just starts going crazy. The PCs have to stop it. Maybe they kill them. Maybe they subdue them. And then another person. And then another person. And so you have that classic sort of movie moment where the entire village is now marching toward the PCs at the center. And they have to find a way through. And again, you're setting up, do you kill them? 
Like, do you just kill everyone in town? But what if they're just under a temporary madness and you're murdering them if you kill them? And can they find a way to wait it out to subdue them or just get away without actually killing everyone in the village? We are very uh, sadistic uh, game masters of that <laughs> game. <laughs> okay, you, the creature you attacked, it was not really mean. You hurt it and people were... <laughs> said, okay, the villagers, you know they're not mean, but they're going to kill you if you don't do something. You're yeah. Like, ah. So, <laughs> yeah, a bit like... Uh, I just like quoting movies. Uh, the Crazies was a bit like that. Yes, people's, yeah, yeah. Not zombies, but just uh, going mental. Uh, yeah, yeah. How do we tie uh, all that together? So we had the guy in the beginning. He found something under the cliffs. Uh, we got the the sort of inquisitor. We got the big creature. We got the tradition. Um, yeah, is it is the 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 substance being tainted by this thing? Maybe the villagers themselves were were drinking it happily. Uh, they were that was something they were sharing with the creatures. They, they like a very good, I don't know, some kind of ambrosia. So it was very popular, uh, at least among them. But uh, now it's getting getting more and more tinted, and 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 maybe that's why the creature went crazy. Maybe they did not run out of that substance. Is that unbeknownst to them initially, that substance or a batch of that substance is tainted. So that's why the creature we seen in the previous scene went crazy that was the first symptom and the second symptom is that the population themselves as the 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 feast on that liquid uh is starting to um, to influence them as well now yeah i i guess i'm trying to put it in the words of is it intentional so either the the person who found these clues and starting to unravel this conspiracy that learning these things can draw can drive them mad, which again is a very Call of Cthulhu thing. Is it the enemies who are trying to protect this conspiracy are poisoning people who might be aware? So like they could poison the village, hoping that they will ki- then kill the PCs who are, who are getting too close. Or again, is it a natural reaction to what's happening as the pieces are falling into place? It's disturbing the ecosystem. The giant snapper turtle is moving, and that. Uh, you know that changes the ecosystem and then it changes maybe maybe the turtle was sucking up this energy or this drinking from a pool that kept that water from flowing into somewhere else um we could also have the turtle being the thing that i think you mentioned being senseless and normally it's a very passive creature but now it's attacking so that that's a different twist on using that creature Mm -hmm. well you know these turtles are all through the forest they're monstrous beasts but they're very docile you know, we use them for labor. Like some, sometimes they, you know, almost like use them like elephants in a pet, uh, in a zoo. And now they're going crazy and they become a danger. Why are they suddenly um, becoming vicious? So then now, now you are fighting them, but you're trying to not fight and kill all of them. You're trying to figure out what happened to them. So I could see us using that idea of that rage in multiple ways. So what is our next card there, Caleb? So we've got a creature, Dryad Horror. I'm tempted to say that to maybe to solve the mystery, the the players will have to go in a place where humans are not supposed to go. So that's a place which is known to be dangerous by the villagers, uh, the corner which is sacred, which would never attack the village on uh, usual, uh, in, uh, usually, sorry. Uh, but right now, the players might have found out something and they need to go there to, 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 uh, to really understand what's going on because there's something ancient and powerful there. It's sort of a Dagobah things. They need to go to this place, which seems very, uh, weird and dangerous, but there, there should be old knowledge there, something powerful. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's dangerous just to consider going there. Now, I, I, I'm right on the same page with you. What it makes me think of is Aragog from the Harry Potter movies, where they go into the dark forest, they get to the giant spider, and the giant spider tells them information that is helpful toward solving the mystery, but then says, eh, sorry, but I'm going to eat you now, or my kids are going to eat you. So yeah, so you go talk to this dryad, and the dryad can give information, maybe maybe unravel some of the clues because it's been around. It's a, almost like an eternal spirit. Maybe it knows the next piece of the puzzle or it can help put pieces together. It could maybe tell them why the turtles are going crazy. But it's like, sorry, but no, no humans are allowed here. So too bad, so sad. And then you have a combat where you have to 
you know, maybe the forest comes alive. So you're not actually fighting the dryad, but you're fighting vines and trees that are trying to pull at you, you know, swamp water underneath your feet, kind of a, a lightning sand from Princess Bride type of a thing. So, yeah, I really like the idea of like a forbidden knowledge that you you can get helpful information, but it could kill you. And you don't have to do it. This could be like a side adventure where, yeah. you know, if they don't go talk to the Dryad, they can still solve the mystery. But if they go there and survive, then it gives them a huge advantage in maybe a later part of the adventure. Yeah, and, and really make the, the journey to there, maybe not long, but especially dangerous. So really play with uh, not traps set by people but natural traps with uh, bugs and uh, uh, quicksands and and stuff like that uh, all along the way uh, uh, recently I, I played a, a game where my, my players ended up in the, the shadow fell mm-hmm. and uh, I roll on the the what I use the mother of all encounter table and I rolled no encounter but actually I played with it the fact that the players were very frustrated not to have anything to fight but all the time being in a very stressful situation because each step they would take in the environment was was a, a real danger of a, a very very sad and pathetic but real death for the for their characters. Yeah, I'm a, I'm actually a fan of skill challenges. It's one of the things that I I don't like the way Fourth Edition did skin t- did skill challenges, but I enjoy the concept and I've I've modified them. I have my own way of doing them, but I could see that being a skill challenge encounter, not a combat encounter. Where again, like you said, like they're going through the forest and the forest is fighting them. It's not draw your swords. It's how do you not get swallowed by the bog or captured by the vine. Okay, our next card is called Strength of Arms. So this is a this is an incident in, in the game. It's a one time plus two plus two. It's like a surge of of power. Uh, so this could be. You know, again, we, we've already established that maybe there might be some sort of like medicinal agents that this village or this continent, this country, this army uses. So maybe this is another one that they've developed where they take this and it gives them a short boost. And we could even maybe tie this back to the senseless rage where it's very common for their soldiers to take this, you know, it's like a, like a dose, like a chemical, and it gives them increased prowess for a short period of time when they get ready to go into battle, but it's been corrupted. And so now as they're taking it, that it turns into madness. So rather than being a one-time bonus, it gives them the bonus for a long time, but it drives them mad. Maybe that's what tainted the thing in the first place. Maybe that uh, figure of authority. I really like the idea of taking the, the character on the picture and making her uh, the, the second in command or even maybe a, a higher officer than the one we already seen. Uh, and maybe... Maybe actually what happened is that the Empire was already there in the village trying to, to modify things to, 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 to turn that, that product into something giving strength to their soldiers. And in the process, they, they corrupted it. So and again, it could be intentionally corrupting it. It could be a conspiracy. It could have been an accident. So this doesn't, it doesn't have to be part of the, the main story. This could, again, be sort of a, a side challenge that... They need to look for this antidote uh, to keep this village or possibly the entire empire from being destroyed from within by this blood rage sort of disease. Yep. Okay. Cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, Our next card here is called Aim High. It's an interesting figure. So this could be an NPC who could be helpful to to the PCs. Maybe they know also another piece of the puzzle they have some information that could be helpful. So rather than go into the lone dryad, wh- who will give them information but possibly try to kill them, maybe an alternate option is to find this person who will need their help fighting something else and in exchange will give them the same information. So you could have two options to get into the same information. One, you you are attacked by the dryad. The other, you have to help this guy do a thing, kill these things that have been hunting him or some other uh, innocent that they're trying to protect. What are, what are you thinking? Well, there, there are a couple of things, really. First, looking at the creatures, uh, I, I think it would be nice to have the idea of things are ramping up. So first, 
you had uh, those Tarras-like creatures which used to be peaceful, which are not anymore, but you need to go to the forest to, to be in danger of being attacked by them. Then you had the villagers starting to go crazy. And I think now creatures in the forest are going even crazier, maybe growing and even maybe attacking the village and, and flying around. So so things are really putting pressure on, on the playing characters to, to act because the, the threat is growing and growing. And then looking at this character, I find what is interesting. So we established the authority, the orders, they had this white uniform. So, and this one is in red. So I'm thinking maybe when they find this character, when they got this encounter, when they run into this character, which this NPC, which could help them, maybe that character is from a, a, an enemy army and they save that character. So maybe we're doing a bit too much of the enemy, which is not an enemy, but I like the idea of they find this NPC is or she's from uh, a, a foreign army, which was and she was there to maybe to spy on them, or she was a scout and she was surrounded by this creature. So they can save uh, him. Uh, if that happened, that character will be uh, thankful for that and maybe give away some information uh, he gathers, or and then the, the characters have to decide whether or not they, they're going to take this. Uh, enemy soldier back to the the authority or if they're gonna keep it as an ally with them and work together or just let that character go and maybe he or she can come back later which could be again an issue with with the authority saying wait a minute we know you uh you had been in contact with someone fr from the the enemy's army so yeah so what what I'm thinking is a different way to handle that without without making it too big. Not that there's a problem with that, but maybe this person is a deserter, so they're not from an opposite force, but they are formally within the same force. They left or they went AWOL, and maybe because they learned something, maybe they were discharged because they challenged authority. So this this would lean towards the fact that there's a conspiracy within the organization that's helping to bring about this event, and this person's like. Like I was there, I saw them do this thing, which made things worse. And that's how come I got, you know, discharged. So it could be, again, I keep using the phrase, another piece of the puzzle that yes, our organization is, has been infiltrated by a, a corruption and some of the members are actively working against the good of the entire empire or whatever. And again, free, again, to be clear, we, we don't know anything about the actual lore that comes with the Innistrad. So we may be recreating what, what's in there. I have no idea. Uh, so don't, please don't hold that against us. Uh, but I like the idea of it being a former member than, than an opposite uh, military organization. Yeah, but it, it can accomplish in... the same thing. Yeah, it ties in very nicely. I, I love it too. And you still have the issue if you run back with the authority of, wait a minute, you, you've been hiding a known deserter or traitor to, uh, to the empire. So yeah, you, you could take perfect. them in and then they get arrested and now they're going to be executed. So then do you save them and then you become enemies of the empire? So again, you're, you're, you're putting the characters in situations where they have to make moral decisions where there's not an easy answer. And, and you can for, you can foreshadow that you can earlier in the game there can be poster at the village at the town hall saying uh, looking for this person uh, he or she is a traitor and uh, the authority is looking for for that person so you you can bring the character there much earlier and and build a bit of um, yeah of anticipation from the other characters who, who might even you might have even stuff like the characters might think before meeting uh, uh, him or her that uh, that that might be the person responsible for for what is going on maybe the reputation of that character is being um uh what's the word um right. Char yeah. character assassination yeah the, the 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 character this character the authority or the the people the conspirators are, are putting a, a great deal of effort to make that person sound like a, a, a terrible person where why that person is not yeah, actually, I like the idea of very early in the adventure, the PCs are present at an execution for a criminal. So, nice. So they have no reason to be involved. They're not going to, you know, like this seems like it's a normal thing that happens in this empire. Criminals are, are killed by hanging or, or beheading. And that's just the scene where something else is happening. Maybe even where they are, are, are contacted by an agent of their NPC contact saying, hey, I'm learning some stuff. This is very interesting. You need to... You, know, you need to come 
to me, I got, I got stuff to show you. And the backdrop is this execution of this traitor. And it's connected to, you know, we give this guy, so Eric the Red, because uh, they it's the same uniform, but they've dyed them all red. And he's the leader. And th we've captured one of his men and he's being executed. So it's just almost like it's a throwaway, just world building thing. And then later it ties back where, well, we got to go talk to this guy. Turns out maybe he's a good guy. It's actually similar to the Dryad. You you need to go find something which is potentially uh, dangerous. Yep. Awesome. So our next card is called Shambling Back. Or sorry, Shamble Back, not Shambling. Shamble. So this is straight up, it's a zombie. It's a it's an undead creature returned from beyond. My, I have two instant thoughts. One, toss this card because... I don't know that zombies really fit, you know, uh, maybe too many ingredients into the pot. The other thing is that perhaps this is the ultimate goal of whatever this conspiracy is, is that there's a long dead emperor or, or soldier, or king, wizard king, whatever. And all of this conspiracy is designed to bring about the return of that despot. Uh, into the world to take over the empire. I don't like the idea of just adding zombies into the mix, especially if we're going to use that senseless rage earlier as a zombie-like madness. Mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit too too much. But what are you thinking? Well, first of all, I'd like to read the quote with a very thick French accent because uh, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, lost loved ones are never truly gone. <laughs> Sounds better than mine, that's for sure. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I too. What, what I like, maybe still in the idea of ramping up uh, the situation, uh, not putting aside the idea of a of a zombie. What I like is the birds there, and I was wondering maybe. So we had this thing which started contaminating people. Then it ramped up with the the, the creatures, etc. Maybe at this point, the the characters have reached a moment where well, we know what it com where it comes from we can just tell people not to drink it anymore and that might solve the things except maybe at that moment and that's what this picture shows um, there's an attack of birds a bit like uh, sort of like well the birds but uh, the birds themselves are not a danger but the thing has become contagious and you if you're bitten by a bird uh, you go into that rage, exact same rage that we described earlier, but suddenly people have to plank their windows and the whole village is on shutdown mode and have to protect for, from everything because, yeah, it's a contagion sort of situation if they get bitten specifically by, by those birds. Maybe, I don't know. Otherwise, we, we toss it aside. I mean, and we could toss it. Uh, one thing you said there that, that sparked an idea for me is we could combine it in a way with that madness from earlier where the idea was, do you, you challenge the PCs to not just lay waste to everyone that, you know, killing these people affected by the madness could be a bad thing because they're eventually going to get over it. Well, what happens if you kill them? They then are the zombies. So not only do you have the moral dilemma of do you kill them or not, but all the ones that you kill come back as zombies. If you can ride it out and wait the two days or the three days or even maybe it's just two hours that they're they're infected and not kill them, then it's okay. But if you kill them, that they raise as zombies and now you have to fight them again. So that's sort of the quote unquote punishment for killing them is that you then create more danger. I'm still mm -hmm. leaning towards tossing it, but that is one way that I could see it being used. I, I think I was on the same line with you. I'm, I'm not a fan of zombies. Uh, I think that there's a bit... Uh, personally, I've got a, a bit of a zombie... Uh, uh, oversaturation? Uh, yeah, oversaturation. There's, uh, there's a new show with Drew Barrymore. It's zombies again. And uh, Anyway. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would toss the, the zombie idea, uh, whatever we do. Uh, so we, we can toss the card, uh, okay. I think. All right, our next card is a, a Voldaren Duelist. So, so maybe that's the person who was all behind that? I, I see this more of a, um, again, like an assassin that's sent, uh, like when you're getting maybe to like the two-thirds of the way through the conspiracy, and the main bad guys are like, okay, these PCs are close enough. Now it's time to send my lieutenant after them. 
And so this is just a straight up combat encounter with uh, a, a, a single opponent that has all these abilities because it's, it's a vampire as well, which we, again, we don't have to make him undead. But this one creature, this one person is a, is a, a match for almost the entire party. Uh, you know, very arrogant, just comes straight out and says, I'm going to kill you. Be prepared. Because uh, it's nice to have a combat, especially with some of the other gotchas, where it's just, yep. I'm a bad guy. We're going to fight. You need to kill me before I kill you. Yeah, and uh, I, w- I think the game master could have the option that if the players did get along with the deserter, uh, that new NPC here is also out to to kill that uh, ally of them, so that so the, you can have an encounter where where not only they have to defend themselves and defeat the, that foe, but that foe would have its main objective would be to kill that ally of them so so if he managed to kill that 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 characters then uh, that villain can can just uh, leave and come back later and the encounter is still a failure uh, for for the the playing characters even though they they did not actually die uh, during the the encounter yeah i when i design encounters or adventures i should say i like to have almost like if then statements where, like, I know that this is going to be an encounter at some point, but the when and why and how can be different. So it, it could be a situation where if they work with the deserter and they don't let the deserter be punished, then this person comes in to kill the deserter and by association kill the party. If they don't work with the deserter, that, that encounter doesn't happen or that doesn't play out the same way, then this, this encounter will just happen later on in the story when they've gotten too close to the, to the final. So I know I'm going to use this encounter, but based on the player's actions and choices and decisions, it could happen at different points in time. So, yeah, so I definitely like the idea of this guy maybe is after the deserter. Mm-hmm. And because the PCs have found and brought this person into the light of, of the day, then this person is dispatched to kill them. And like if the PCs turn the deserter over to the authorities, then he could be an official person. He just shows up as an official of the Empire, says, okay, I'm here to oversee the execution of the deserter. Okay, so in that case, maybe the PCs let the deserter be killed because they think that's what's supposed to happen. And then, okay, high five, thank you for doing your just your du- duty to the Empire. And then it's not till way later that they come back and now they have to fight this person who then they realize, well, we let this guy kill somebody who was probably innocent now that we think about it. I, I like I like the idea uh, that they, even the, if they bring the deserter, this guy will come to kill the deserter because I find in the picture, again, he's very, so obviously a villain. Yes. So if this guy would show up at the start of the, the execution being like, I'm here to... Uh, take care of what needs to be done. Uh, the playing characters will already be in a situation like, wait, wait a minute, we this guy seems really, really not cool. He seems a little uh, too excited about this. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's his deal? And he's like, well, thank you very much for giving me uh, the opportunity to get rid of uh, the, the empire of this felony. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I really, I really like the way those two cards play together. All right. Got a few more left. Uh, our next card is Compelling Deterrence. You know, this he's base- awesome. He's, he's so awesome. <laughs> he likes. He looks like the a bit the um, uh, John Carpenter's The Fog, but yes. meets Goro from Mortal Kombat. Well, what, <laughs> but what, what sticks stuff out in his hands? What sticks out to me is if you look at just his face, one it kind of looks like Zoidberg from yes. Fam- <laughs> from Futurama, but he kind of looks sad. He's, he's yes. like he's like he's sad that the villagers run away. Like, he just wants to play. He he's not mean. He just wants to hang out. But why does everyone run from him? So he's like a misunderstood giant uh, who happens to be terrifyingly evil. Apparently, um, it's it's probably the big project of the empire that there are super weapons that they they're trying to build. I guess which as we're going towards the end, which is the the, the I guess the big reveal in the end. I don't know. Yeah, you know, this falls in, into like the undead category. I would be very, very okay with just tossing this out. Uh, but it could also, like I said, maybe this is the ultimate goal. It's the super secret or the super soldier project, project uh, you know, from comic books where they're trying to make these soldiers that um, can go in behind enemy lines. They are basically already dead, so you can't kill them. They're 
they're like Swiss Army men. They can handle any situation because they've got all these attachments. <laughs> um, it is a Swiss Army man. He's got five arms with a different tool at the end of it each. Yeah, it's it's a little bit crazy, but uh, so I mean, this could be a this could be another straight combat encounter with a with a Frankenstein like monstrosity. Once they've gotten into the the heart of the conspiracy, where like wherever the the main base of operations is, they're. Uh, they're building these creatures and one gets free. But I, I really am focused on how they the creature looks sad. So I like yeah. the idea that they could potentially turn this into an ally. Like if they don't just attack it and kill it, but if they find a way to, to reason with it and communicate, maybe it could be an ally and help them against the masters who have been experimenting on it. Yeah, I would try to, to stress it, that find a way to say it's not a zombie per se, it's more... Yes, someone very tough and strong who's been experimented upon, but but I just love the look of that creature. I, I, it's 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 so it's so over the top, and as you said, the, the face looking sad and uh, Zoidbergish. It's yeah, I just want us to keep it just because of the look of it. So <laughs> yeah, the other thing you could do is maybe again you could tie this into an early encounter where maybe there's a almost like a Hodor type character from Game of Thrones. It's like a simpleton that is in one of the areas and you know is helpful but uh, but looked down upon, and maybe that person gets arrested uh, by the Empire and, and is is taken away. And this could be a conflict, you know, like an early non combat conflict between the empire's authority and the pcs and then later this is the monstrosity so you've yeah. got that connection back to oh this is just the you know the guy the the, uh, the the livery stable man who helps take care of the horses and now he's turned into this monster you probably would push them more towards talking than killing in that situation mm -hmm, yeah okay yeah no i i like that i like the idea of the the stable man uh or, or the type of character which you meet in the beginning and you can have it's nice because you are you're starting to build uh, what you're gonna have in the setting in the very early stages of the the game. So you got your cliffs, you go there, you got the village. There's posters because apparently there's some deserters uh, doing stuff in the forest. Uh, you got this NPC now who's this friendly but not very uh, bright person. Uh, who can uh, so you got a lot of NPCs early on which can come to play later. That's that's awesome. Awesome. All right, uh, here is our next card. It's the Spectral Shepherd. I don't know. So far, we've been almost steampunkish with what we've been doing, and this is suddenly very magic -y. So I don't know. Well, maybe the, it inspires you more, Michael. I'm kind of leaning the same way where, you know, I really I don't think we need zombies in this game. I also don't think we need ghosts. Um I love the art. I think it's very cool, but I don't think it fits this particular adventure. Um, so I would be completely okay with just tossing this one aside and, and saving it for a different adventure a different day. Okay, let's save it then. So, all right. So our next card here is called Ongoing Investigation. So it, it just kind of ties back into, I think, you know, our our theme of finding clues and uncovering this conspiracy of some sort where uh, this could be the official organization that, again, is, might be working against us in ignorance, they find a clue. Maybe they don't want to share it with us, but we. But they've they started acting weird in a way, so we know they know something. Uh, I, I think what it, what's interesting in the, the picture, and we already uh, had a, a stable boy uh, being turned into something horrible, and here in that picture, the people investigating, first of all, the, 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 the way they are around the place reminds of, uh, you know, this classic scene, uh, like in Stranger Things, for instance, where everybody in the city goes through the woods with torches and lamps and starts searching for someone who has disappeared. And in the front of the picture, there's a woman, and I believe she's holding um, a doll. So maybe, again, ramping up the stakes, no, uh, a young child has disappeared and there's all, the characters have all the reasons to assume that that child might be turned into, into something else. So maybe, yeah, that's you no, know, the, the villagers are, are looking for someone who, who disappeared. So we, we could uh, circle back around to the, the, uh, the oafish giant. Maybe they weren't arrested. Maybe they went missing. And then they were later turned into this monster. So now when we have a young child go missing... We are concerned about the same thing. 
Um, or maybe again, the oaf could still be arrested and turned into the monster. But now this this creep, this young girl or this young boy, uh, or just children in in general are starting to go missing, and that definitely would ramp up the sort of the tension. You know, it puts a it puts a clock on the PC's actions. They either have to solve the entire mystery before something happens to these children, or they have to find and rescue that child first. Um, Maybe so, that child. Maybe that child was related to the stable boy. Maybe uh, they they disappeared together. Maybe it was a uh, a smart little sister. So you would have the sort of deal with a somewhat old, a very strong, very tall, uh, dim stable person and uh, a younger child, but much smarter and uh, and uh, with wit compared to him. And and they both disappear. I know that we found the brother. The the concerns for the the what happened, the fate of that child is uh, yeah is is popping up. Okay, our next card, which is a multicolor card, I can tell, is Sigarda Heron's Grace. Uh, it's again, it's very mystical and magical suddenly. So yeah, again, I'm not very inspired by this one. What about you, Michael? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's very cool looking card, but I don't think it, it, it. Like I said, we're we're doing almost like a Call of Cthulhu game, like very uh, political and investigative. And then all all these cards that have to do a lot with like really powerful magic don't don't really seem to fit. Though this could then be the bad guy. So rather than that that zombie creature that that might have been awakened earlier, maybe this is the thing that is trying to return to our world, and it, it is mystical. Uh, you know, we're in a world that doesn't have that much. Uh, extra planar magic type of stuff but maybe this is what the church the organization whatever uh, this is their true master and they're trying to reawaken or, or or free them from a prison extra dimensional or whatever and bring them back into our world so this could be the ultimate climatic battle where mm -hmm. once it all comes to a head they have to fight this thing that's that's really the only way i think i could use this would be this would have to be the final boss yeah, and maybe we don't have to, to take the picture uh, literally. Maybe what it shows is uh, an angelic figure which turns to be some very uh, demonic and aggressive towards them. So maybe, uh, I think earlier we picked a card with um, another character with that white uniform and long blonde hair. So uh, this could be that this character doesn't literally have wings on its back but was taken to be the, the ultimate angel and character of virtue uh, in that thing and turns out to be that main villain that very evil and bad person whether or not she's literally possessed or she's got a, a bad motive but the the point is really this turning point from that npc early on which seems like much nicer than the other inquisitor much more well intended towards the pc and and really concerned and listening to them and helpful to people and and very worried about the disappearance of that child maybe that character happens to be yeah, the all big villain so what i'm thinking now actually is maybe maybe this is like a, a mythical figure that our church slash organization worships almost like a saint Yep. Uh, and maybe even that potion, that antidote, that uh, alchemical potion that they drink that gives them that their short burst of power, which now becomes madness. Maybe it's called Heron's Grace, uh, and it's supposed to be the dilution of this figure, um, like th the essence of their power. And then it's like almost like a worshiping thing. So this could be like a truly a symbol, not an actual figure in the game. Yeah, yeah. Also, maybe you think this, uh, it, it looks like really Wrath of God sort of thing. So maybe what what's happening in the background is that whatever synergy there was around was considered as something impure by the authority and sort of uh, taking things too far uh, religion-wise and uh, they, they want a, a cleansing in a sort of a inquisitorial sort of things uh, so the, what's been happening is that those people wanted to to purge what was happening there which was not evil by, by any mean but uh, they, they consider it to be uh, inappropriate so our last card here is uh, a dual card it's a Kessig excuse me a Kessig Forge Master I can't talk a Kessig Forge Master and on the other side it is a Flameheart Werewolf so 
going back to kind of the, the theme of this game, I don't know that having a werewolf really fits, but I like the idea of the duality of nature and maybe maybe our NPC contact that got us into this adventure to begin with is behind everything or or someone else that we meet early on who seems to be a helpful member of the guards or organization, maybe a cleric in this, this church. Uh, who is aiding us along the way is actually the the main bad guy. I know that's not a new concept and it's probably been done to death, but other than using that as like the duality of nature and and the the darkness being hidden within someone, I'm not getting a lot of inspiration from that card. I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, let, let's quote one of our favorite uh, license out there. Uh, it's a bit uh, Twilight. <laughs> situation the, the no I, what i mean is i was thinking this this character on the kesi forge master um i don't know it looks like a character who's not part of the authority but I, i'm just wondering if the final big battle will should the the playing characters actually embrace the power of nature and and drink uh, an alternate drink which is related to the whole story but which will buff them like crazy for a final fight between nature and quotation mark civilization uh, uh and yeah they so they yeah they they, they found something maybe there's a, a shaman and the, sh the dichotomy between shaman and this official religion that we're starting to 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 describe maybe that's that's the thing the, the the final choice of the character is okay are you gonna go take this fight against the authority and if you do so uh the the shaman it doesn't have to be literally a shaman but they, they're gonna have to use what they do was something somewhat negative which is what's been happening with with these filters and and drinks etc and go ahead and drink it have a big buff and uh, go go take it against the against the army so sort of a risk versus reward where they they try to take this potion which they know could cause them to go mad but it might be the only thing that gives them the power they need to overcome the main conflict yeah the last stand uh, is uh, there's no way you're going to beat uh, that encounter unless you go ahead and drink that. And, and of course, you, you think of alternative, which would be negotiating their way out or, or, or losing something to the authority or accepting to, to be on the side of the authority, although they, they might not agree with it. It's, um, yeah, it, can, it, it could be fun. Uh, and maybe it involves more creatures, a bit like, um, not, not creatures, but uh, in, in Jack Burton, where you they, they all go and they, they got a group of... Uh, uh, somewhat seedy uh, bunch <laughs> who go, go fight uh, along them uh, against the authority. Okay, no, I think that can work. And our last card is actually just a token. It's the uh, the human soldier token card. So, for anyone listening, hopefully this has been insightful to you. The idea is to just take the cards and in whatever way they inspire you to to outline an adventure. I'm sure with a little bit more time writing some things out i could i could definitely turn this into an adventure that we could run maybe even a campaign like i may, i think maybe that might be some of our struggle is that we have so much going on it might be better to sort of spread it out a little bit more but i still really enjoy this process i think it's a lot of fun caleb thank you so much for joining me uh, as always anyone who watched if you would have used the cards differently let us know in the comments, send us an email, find us on Facebook or Twitter. Let us know what you would have done with the same cards. Maybe the ones we didn't really use, we kind of tossed out how you could have incorporated them and kept the kept all of them in there and, and, and the story that you would have created. And uh, if you play anything of that, uh, wow, I would like so much to hear about it. If you happen to to like some of these ideas and put it in your one of your story or campaign and uh, actually played it, uh, wow, I would be very amazed to to hear uh, your stories or oh you did that or what did you tweak and uh, or whether or not your your players enjoyed it and, right. and rebelled against you and you told them that's not my fault it's the fault of the rpg academy <laughs> and that stupid guy with a french accent uh -huh. that, that's as far as my french accent goes but but thank you guys for watching and for your listening french is a pirate <laughs> a pirate <laughs> no uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's still a little it's better than my english anyway 
Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please consider subscribing to the RPG Academy YouTube channel. Uh, follow the links that should be on the screen right now to some of our other things that we have on here. And until next time, remember at the RPG Academy, if you're having fun, you're doing it right. Thanks. And we'll see you next time.